Great, okay. Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Miles J. Linton. I'm the Vice Chancellor's Fellow in Young People's Mental Health here in the Elizabeth Blackwell Institute. I'm here with Ruth Day, who is the Student Living Officer for the Students' Union, and Olivier Levy, who is the Chair of the Wellbeing Network, also for the Students' Union. Um, so we're here for World Mental Health Day, particularly with a focus on student mental health and university mental health more broadly. Um, we are going to be talking about all of those topics and particularly a focus on student life during the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but just before we jump into that, are you both able to give me just a bit of a brief overview of what your roles involve? Should I go first? I'll go first. Um, yeah, so hi, my name's Ruth and I'm the Student Living Officer at Bristol SU. Um, and I'm one of the seven elected full-time officers at the SU, so we work full-time representing students. And my remit is all around mental health and wellbeing, housing and sustainability. Um, hi, my name's Olivier, uh, my pronouns are he, him, and I'm chair of the Wellbeing Network. Um, I suppose the like, Wellbeing Network's first responsibility is to organise events and work with societies uh, dedicated to improving all aspects of wellbeing, but with an emphasis on mental health. Uh, being chair, I act as an intermediary between students, the full-time officers at, at the SU, such as Ruth, and officials at the university. Great, yeah, no, I think we've definitely got the right people on the call. <laughs> So um, my pronouns are also he, him. I think before we jump into the questions I had planned around um, university mental health, maybe just as a start of how have you two been managing during the, during the pandemic? What's, what's life looking like at the moment? It's all a bit wild. So, cause I'm working um, full time with the SU, it's a lot of working from home, trying to, tr basically trying to keep my work life and my home life separate. So, you know, I'm trying to work in a separate room from the room in which I sleep, which is quite nice. But, you know, I do miss, you know, being in an office with people. That is, would be an ideal situation. But, yeah, sadly, we're all at home at the moment. Uh, personally, I, I, I'm very grateful for this, like, responsibility. It, it's been keeping me busy. Um, but uh, I've just been very, like, grateful for, for, for weather and... Um, being able to spend more time with my family, which is a uh, rare season. We live like very far apart from each other, but I guess I'm, I'm doing quite well. Thank you. That's good. I mean, you've mentioned something interesting already about keeping busy, and I wondered how you think that might play into well being at the moment. Um, well, I think um, a sense of achievement is something I've always thrived on. Um, approaching like, a stressful task in like, a confident way and seeing it rather as uh, an objective I know I can complete, sorry, and enjoying the like satisfaction and sense of um, gratification that stems from it. Uh, it has really helped me a lot in these last few months. Um, I, I, I think my like low points when it comes to mental health uh, coincide with not feeling I've achieved anything in a while. Um, so at the, at the end of the, each day when I'm you know, like washing the dishes or like brushing my teeth, um, I like to think of like the good moments of the day, the like small things that made me smile, even if it's like a, a, a silly joke that like, made someone laugh or like a tasty porridge I made that morning. And it's just happiness for me is like an achievement uh, as much as anything. And I think taking the time to recognize the things that make me happy, um, that's what, what I use to look after my mental health. Yeah. Hmm, okay. Does any of that resonate with you, Ruth? I think all of it does, to be honest, like I'm really, really grateful that I have this job right now because it means I have something set to do between nine and five when you do kind of see tangible outcomes. And I like Olivier, I like I like to think that I'm doing something. I quite like to think that I'm making change. And, yeah, and the fact that I have this kind of like imposed structure to my day, I think also really helps because I think it's quite easy in lockdown to just, you know, not have any kind of sense of the passage of time because it all kind of blurs into one. Whereas the benefit of like doing this in the SU means that, you know, I know what I know when the week is, I know when the weekend is. So, yeah, I do. Olivia, I think we're quite similar in that. <laughs> That's good. I, I, so I wonder whether that idea of structure and keeping busy and having kind of objectives and outcomes and things, how that might be particularly relevant for students now starting university, either freshly or coming back to university and university looking a little bit, well, I say a little bit, looking very differently to how it did, um, you know, 
six, seven, eight, nine months ago. How, how, what will that structure look like for students in your opinion and how do you think they should navigate it? I think as much synchronous teaching that can be done as possible would be really helpful because it means they have something very specific to do at specific times. Obviously, like asynchronous teaching can't be helped, especially if students are studying in different time zones. But the fact that there will be that timetable um, between, I guess it's eight, nine and eight p.m. now um, on the weekdays will actually be quite helpful for students. And the fact that, you know, societies, society stuff will start happening again mostly online sadly though in the evening so it will give it will give people something to do rather than just sort of you know feeling like feeling like nothing's on and just kind of yeah feeling a bit confused about what to do yeah just for anyone who isn't super familiar with the with the the lingo um (laughs) (laughs) how would you describe that well that difference between kind of synchronous and asynchronous um so synchronous is when it's so it's like a specific timetable time so it's like at 9 a.m you'll have a maths lecture asynchronous is when it's like teaching content but it doesn't happen in real time so it's yeah so there the, this is what happened a lot oh so i was stud i was studying over when it was like proper lockdown um back in whenever it was like march or whatever so what we'd have we wouldn't have specific lectures we'd have staff they they'd like write up they write up some maths lecture notes and then they post it at like 12 p.m so instead of it like being an actual lecture in real time it would be there'd be teaching material for you to go through outside of that whereas then with philosophy we actually had sync what called synchronous seminars so we'd have a seminar you have a seminar at 11 a.m log on to your computer and um yeah engage in the seminar okay so uh, olivia what thinking about students who are just coming to university who you know haven't studied in universities before versus those students who are maybe coming back for their second or third year of study what do you think some of the differences and the challenges they experience might might be i appreciate that it's a bit of a big question <laughs> no it's okay um i i think ruth is back on that when uh, they say that we're gonna have to adapt um uh you know, synchronous asynchronous ways of teaching but um i'm actually strangely optimistic for this new structure um it's true that like social occasions will be limited but uh we're gonna get better at adapting to virtual atmospheres um i expect actually that i'll be engaging with my tutors a lot more um as we've gotten used to communicating with them online and students living far away from the university campus Uh, might find their tutors a lot more accessible and easier to reach because it's no longer a matter of having to, you know, check the campus to go see them. Um, And perhaps as a result of having been quite bored over the next few months, um, students might be more inclined to join societies and undertake the the kind of um, extracurricular work that makes university life more interesting and a, a lot more varied. So my advice with uh, students would be not to feel too overwhelmed by this change in uh, in routine and structure and and uh, atmosphere, um, but to see how they can take advantage of it and um, and prosper. Great. Just just on that, because I know you have kind of a really wide remit with the Wellbeing Network. For anyone who isn't familiar with that, what are the kind of things that you in that role would be hoping to achieve in the next? Um, year or so? Um, well, I think our priority uh, has to be engaging with like both new students uh, and also those who perhaps don't like naturally engage uh, as much with the SU um, to make sure they know where and how they can access wellbeing support, whether it you know, be like mental, social or even um, like environmental wellbeing. Um, that said, like I'm also keen to deliver on some of the projects uh, I drew up pre-lockdown, which consists of making wellbeing services at Bristol um, more accessible, both to international students by offering a, a glossary of translated terms and explanations on the student health website, uh, but also to expanding the kind of wellbeing advice that the SU offers on their website, uh, which at present is quite limited to academic wellbeing, but I think there's a lot of scope to expand it um as other student you know, um student unions across the country do yeah great that all sounds just super cool so, ruth you um so your kind of campaign and maybe what you envision for this role are probably a little bit different now in reality to what you maybe had in role in mind for the role when you 
first envision running for it what i mean what's that like navigating the difference in what university looks like now versus 12 months ago yeah, it's quite a, it's quite interesting it's had a quite a big impact i think on all of our roles as officers so we came in we we were running on manifest like a manifesto with um specific priorities which we're still doing quite a lot of work on but also a lot of the work is more reacting to the covid situation so specifically for me a lot of it is all around situations with accommodation so um students we've, we've put students in living circles at the moment and i think quite a lot of students are starting to struggle to adapt to that to adapt to the fact that you know it's it's freshers and you want to be going out and meeting all these new people but you can only stick within your 15 person like little social bubble just quite a lot of work on that quite a lot of work on um thinking about like lockdown planning essentially so we're thinking as a student union about a sort of a series of asks for the university which we believe that they need to consider in all their lockdown planning so stuff like you know the the operational side like you know how do we get food to students how do we ensure that they can have laundry but also thinking about well-being and thinking about moving all of the well-being provisions completely online so ensuring that students they can you know they can go to like a web page or something and book a slot with a resi life advisor for example um yeah and also stuff like you know how how do we how do we identify students who need more support than like sort of the average student how do we identify those students and ensure that um staff are like aware of them and can actually support them through their needs so it's kind of a mix between you know the the the, the fun plans i had um back in march before lockdown started which was all about you know making our our services like work better for students from liberation backgrounds and like lots of work on um like drugs and alcohol and stuff and combining that work with sort of more reactive stuff but then again i do feel that my role has definitely um, started focusing more on like the drugs and alcohol side of things which i didn't think it would happen because obviously like the way students like interact with substances is completely changing because clubs don't open so something like a really big project um, I'm working on, like in co collaboration with the university, is trying to set up like a drop-in where students can come and pick up drug reagent testing kits because a lot more students will be mixing drugs, getting drugs from not ideal sources because of lockdown. So mixing, providing those, but also giving them a harm reduction intervention with um, a local like Bristol Drugs Project who are really cool. So yeah, the work's kind of shifted more to either reactive or work all around substances as opposed to my, my fun plans, which is all like, let's make sure all personal tutors have trans training and stuff. That's kind of, it's happening, but it's happening not at present. Whereas all of this, the, the more urgent COVID stuff is kind of all on my mind at the moment. Yeah, that, that does make sense. It's, there are a bunch of things there that I want to pick up on, but I'm also mindful that, you know, asking you about what the things that you most enjoy about the role are. Are there things that make a role that is, was already going to be really intensive and now a lot more challenging? What are the things that make it super worthwhile for you? It's really fun, like actually just meeting with students and hearing hearing what they have to say. Olivier, what was it this week? Olivier ran a really good wellbeing mingle, which was like really, really fun to go to. And it's just also being, it's also just really nice being able to like engage with the university. And I don't want to like to my own horn too much, but in that space as a student or like a student representative, you definitely are an expert. And it's quite an interesting, quite an interesting thought that you're, you know, you're, you're in this room with all these people who have been doing their jobs for like 10 years or whatever and they actually want to listen to you and they're actually quite receptive and yeah again going back to what Olivier said earlier you can really see tangible change which is which is really nice and also just the SAB team everyone's really lovely it, you know just we, we it's quite nice to have a little online community of seven of us who are going through the same thing and you know we, we meet every day so it's like you don't actually feel that isolated because there is something to do people to see every single day. Great. I guess same question for you, Olivia. What's the kind of the best thing about the role for you? And also, I guess a follow on question is how are you managing to juggle it with your studies? It sounds like, um, again, not a small remit. <laughs> Um, well, I think, like Ruth, um, I, I really value the opportunity to meet new people and have a, a good reason to collaborate with um, people on a very regular basis, which um, I know I would lack it if I, I wasn't so involved in like SU affairs at the moment. 
Um, I'm in, enjoying collaborating with Ruth and um, the other members of my committee and in societies. Um, but also uh, uh, there, there exists like a, a student um, mental health partnership with uh, members of the University of Bristol, University of West England, the NHS and the local government. Uh, where I, I suppose Ruth and I are, are there as like student representatives uh, and that's been a very very interesting um, take on the challenges that students uh, are facing with regard to the mental health crisis um, and it's interesting to see the input that, that we can offer as student representatives but also what we can take from these experts um, and implement the, their ideas into campaigns that, that we're hosting and, and projects that we're trying to deliver on um with regard to juggling my work and uh, the the well-being um network i think um the university hasn't officially started yet but it's certain that when it does next week i'll um be struggling to f focus to this is, sorry I'll, I'll struggle to, to be balancing both um but at the moment it, it's not posed any problems of being able to like crack on with my uni university work just fine uh, unlike Ruth, my role is um, part-time, so none of us on our committee are expected to be dedicating our full lives to this. And um, I like made it like very clear with my committee members or whenever they're like too stressed to attend a meeting that you know we're not expecting them to be working twenty four seven. It's very very important that they juggle like stress, work, and um, uh, SU expectations uh, evenly. That's, yeah, cool. That all makes sense to me. Um, I, I had to stop myself jumping in. You said something a second ago about working with UE and the NHS in a partnership, looking at young people or student mental health more broadly. And I guess I had a question about, w with your expertise in mind, both of you, in fact, what are the things that you think researchers actively working in this area should be focusing on? What do we not know enough about? What do you think we need to pay more attention to? What are the big drivers of student mental health and well-being, in your opinion, both of you? Um, well, I, for one, um, would be interested to know how many fewer students are going to be impacted by the like, worst COVID-19 symptoms than by severe long-term and overarching mental health problems. Um, you know, if according to like pre-COVID statistics, you know, I think it's something like eighty-three percent of British young adults feel overwhelmed by stress. How is it reasonable to expect us to cope with such like sudden and constant overhauling of our lives and and, and routine? Uh, we're like begging for stability, and I, I'd be interested in research showing how these dramatic and like often confusing announcements and public health guidelines can cause dismay and uh, like distortion of the students' well-being. Yeah, I mean that's a project in itself. <laughs> someone yeah. might, uh, someone might email you about that. <laughs> How about you, Ruth? What What are the kind of big things that you think we need to know more about? I definitely think we need to know more about how like COVID impacts how people uh, the how people access mental health care. I think that be that's really quite important because you know if we don't if we don't know like what people want to access or like how people's access is changing then like the services are just going to sort of stay back in the past and I don't think I really don't think we can actually like afford that and I also just I'm just also genuinely interested to know about like what like what students what students like want to access what they think helps them and what like different types of support impact different people in different ways and yeah just sort of what what is the most beneficial so like I know the university has like a lot of kind of like online app support and I'd be really interested in knowing like do students actually engage with that and does that stuff actually improve their mental health you know we don't really want the university to be putting like resources into like areas which like perhaps there's not much high student uptake or perhaps like doesn't really work for students so yeah I'd be quite I'd be quite interested in like all of that kind of area. okay I mean just just on that and a hunch is fine but do you have a hunch as to what what students do I mean I know students aren't a homogenous group and it's really important for us to acknowledge that different students are going to want different things but do you have a hunch as to how some of those needs might have changed in the last six seven eight nine months regarding where students want to access mental health support from 
I think I think a lot of people want quite proactive sort of outreach or something. You know, you, they want to feel like like they're being looked after and there are people sort of looking out for them rather than just being pointed to self self help resources. I think they want sort of like actual concrete, tangible support. I think the move to online has definitely like changed a lot about counselling and stuff it has I feel like it's benefited some people especially like students with physical disabilities who might not have been able to like access counselling in a physical space it's something that they can access in an online space but then on the flip side to that you know being online kind of changes the vibe I know that's not a very technical term but it does change the vibe and it means it means that some some people might not get the full experience of counselling that they might necessarily want and obviously like there are people with like like anxiety and stuff who just can't handle a video call. So I think it's it's quite interesting to think about its benefit. It's really benefited some people, but also had a negative effect on other people. And sort of thinking about how we can how how we can weigh those those kind of two considerations up to create services which work for everyone. Sounds good. I think we've got two projects yeah. there ready to go. Olivia, did you just <laughs> want to chip in or? Um, no, uh, I just wanted to add that um, I think I, for one, have struggled with the like pace of my life having like slowed down dramatically since March. Um, but I think students um, and friends of mine are uh, perhaps learning to absorb their surroundings more and looking to like, take advantage of the well-being resources that are immediately available. Um, and I suppose our job and the, the job at SU and the uh, student health webs site and the uh, university is to make sure that these resources are immediately accessible and available um that you don't have to like scour the internet to be able to find them that they're present on social media which is going to be our, our probably our, our main like, outlook uh, on the world for next year <laughs> but um I, I, it's, it, it's worth noticing that in the, like a time of like such pessimism um I think we are showing a lot more like gratitude for like the small like pleasures and like bouts of creativity and activity that make a day just a bit less monotonous. Um, that's worth picking up on for me. Nice. I think that's a really neat time for us to wrap up the conversation, I think. Um, thank you both for one, being available to chat while you're also busy, um, two, for being so open and honest and um, yeah, just three for providing such useful insights that I'm sure will paint a clearer picture to other people working in this area about what some of the challenges are for student mental health and well-being at the moment, and just a little bit more about what you do. So, yeah. Thanks for having us. It's been fun. Cool. Okay. Thanks very much, Miles. Chat soon. <laughs>